We need to talk. Welcome to Doha Debates, where we are searching for solutions to global challenges. We are facing one of the greatest global risks of our time, the shortage of water. Water scarcity impacts more than 40% of the world's population. We must depoliticize the drought challenges in the Republic of South Africa. With the expectation of less water over time and more people, how can we sustain life itself? The warnings are clear. The statistics are startling. More than two billion people around the world do not have access to safe drinking water. Half of the world's population will be in water-stressed areas by 2025. That's just over five years from now. So is time running out, or can we still change the forecast? What urgent actions should be taken, and by whom? That is the subject of our debate here tonight in Cape Town. Please welcome your NOHA Debates moderator, Hida Fakhri. Hello, everyone. Thank you all very much indeed for being here. Welcome to our fourth new live Doha debate. We are in South Africa with university students from across Cape Town. We're also live streaming on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube, as well as right here in South, South Africa's own television network, ENCA. Now, access to safe, clean drinking water is a fundamental human right. Yet, the United Nations says that it is one of the greatest challenges of our time, with global water usage growing twice as fast as the world's population. Major cities across the world are facing serious water shortages, not just here in Africa, but Cape Town, where we are, here, where we are tonight, has had to deal with the prospect, the very real prospect, of running out of water. This is the new reality we all face, whether it's climate change and the cycles of drought, whether it is water storage, problems, weak management, or long-standing inequalities. The problems are there. So is there any doubt then that we are facing a global water crisis, and how do we solve it? We'll be hearing from our three guests in just a few moments, but first our correspondent Nelufar can tell us more about how each one of you can get involved in this discussion, Nell. Thank you. Yes, of course, we will be listening intently to our speakers here in the studio, but this is the Doha Debates, which makes it a global one. As ever, we want to hear from you. If you use the hashtag Dear World, we will more readily be able to find your comments on Facebook and Twitter. And make sure you tune in and listen, comment, and tell me what you think. I will be monitoring that for you, Rida. And I, too, very much look forward to a lot of participation because, as you say, Nell, this is a topic that touches so many people around the world and affects us in so many different places. What does the big picture look like? Let's take a quick look with our facts and figures. All of the water on the planet today was here before humans even existed. We have yet to figure out how to make more. To put a number on it, that's roughly one sextillion, 260 quintillion liters of water on Earth. 97% of that is salt water, and the majority of the remaining fresh water is frozen in ice caps and glaciers. So what's actually accessible is just a fraction of a fraction. Funneling enough of the world's fresh water to where it's most needed is difficult at the best of times, and it's only going to get worse. 17 countries are under extremely high water stress, using over 80% of all the water they have every year. Usually, these countries are dry to begin with, and poor infrastructure contributes to wasted water. The climate crisis further exacerbates the reliability of the water supply, with erratic rainfall and hotter days. When droughts do hit, they can be devastating. A human can only survive a few days without water. It can take 3,500 litres of water to grow the food each person needs per day. The United Nations anticipates that two-thirds of the world's population will live in water-scarce regions by 2025. Intense water scarcity could displace 700 million people globally in the years following. 
The chance of cross-border conflicts over water could rise by 95% in the next century. So then, can we all afford to wait, or do we all have to act, whether it is at the global or sub-regional or local or even grassroots level? What are the solutions that will help us move forward and deal with this crisis? We have with us three guests who've joined me here on stage with three very different perspectives on what the way forward should look like and how we make sure that there is access to this basic fundamental human right to everybody in the world. And they are Yana Abu Talib, Oba Keng Liseyani and Georgie Badil. And of course, with us here as well, as always on the Doha Debates, our very own connector, Dr. Govinda Clayton. Dr. Govinda Clayton is a senior researcher in peace processes within the Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich. Dr. Clayton's research interests include negotiation, mediation, conflict management, and civil war. As our connector, Dr. Clayton will provide guidance on identifying common ground and steering towards bridge building and consensus. So welcome to our connector who's joining us here in the audience. And of course, now time to hear from our three guests, just to tell everyone joining us for this discussion that they each have just three minutes to make their case. Do listen to them very carefully, though, because you will then have the chance to react to their arguments. But let's get straight to it. Let's hear from our speakers. Our first speaker, Yana Abu Taleb, believes the water scarcity crisis can only be resolved if people work together, something she believes few people are willing to do. A peacemaker, Yana is the Jordanian director of Eco Peace Middle East in Amman. Water scarcity is real. The solution is pragmatism. I'd love to say it's about justice or about love or about humanity coming forward in bold ways, but it's not. It's about practical solutions in which you get people to put aside our differences, our biases, and work together to do one thing, make water available. The only way to truly resolve the water conflict is cooperation. It isn't easy. It means working with people you might not want to work with. If you really want to know about water scarcity, come visit us in the Middle East. Water is scarce. In Jordan, my country, water consumption average is 80 liters per day. Compare that to the UK at 141 liters per day. To be clear, Jordanians are not less thirsty than Brits. Water is simply less accessible. The problems do not get better by themselves. According to the UN, 97% of Gaza's groundwater will be undrinkable by year 2020. The lack of sanitation is threatening the outbreak of diseases. Can anyone really still be focusing on national solutions to water issues? Really? I work in the Middle East, India, Pakistan, Kosovo, Bosnia, and other conflict zones. My organization, Eco Peace Middle East, creates models of cooperation on water issues. We address water scarcity and water availability. For example, most water resources are far away in Jordan from the centers, making it expensive to pump water. We are promoting cross-border exchanges between Jordan, Israel, and Palestine as a way of reducing the cost of pumping water. Cooperation for mutual benefit, despite our political differences. The problem do not belong to one nation, but affect the entire world. Think about the war in Syria. Consecutive years of drought was a contributing factor to the uprising. Some nations might now think 
and complain about waves of refugees. But the question becomes, are we learning? Considering the magnitude of problems facing humanity, the only way forward is cooperation. Through my work, I focus on ecological peace making efforts. I believe that is the only way forward. Thank you. Our second speaker, Oba Keng Leseone, believes that water scarcity can only be addressed through the fight for social justice and equality. Oba Keng is a South African education advocate, politics fellow, and youth activist. There is no water scarcity. I'm sorry to inform you. Not in South Africa, not in Africa. But we do have a crisis of power and justice. We don't need more NGOs. We don't need more aid. We don't need schools teaching people how to dig wells. These are very well-meaning initiatives. But they merely address symptoms of a bigger problem. They fail to address the structural root of injustice impacting access as well as distribution of water. However, justice as a lens for the debate today will allow for much more complex solutions to emerge. Solutions that take into account systemic problems. Let's explore my home, South Africa, the world's most unequal country. Here, the divide between the poor and the rich is so evident, often walking distance between one another. You cannot speak about access to water without thinking about, you cannot speak about access to water as well as management of it without addressing the structural legacy of, of without addressing the structural legacy of apartheid, which, by the way, 25 years later, still continues along the same racial lines as the, day that it, as the day that it was created. In times of limited access to water, the rich are very much protected by their privilege, allowing them the exact same comforts that they used to, their pools, their showers, their gardens, while, while the poor really, really fight for survival. Water for cooking, drinking, if lucky, bathing. Ultimately, this debate tonight is about, justice denied in is about justice denied in times of crisis. When water becomes scarce, whose lives do we value the most? If we dare to be honest, systems protect the rich. The UNDP says that there is enough water in most countries, including South Africa, to meet household, agricultural, as well as environmental needs. What causes the problem here tonight is an unequal system of access rather than shortage of water itself. Therefore, we sit with a justice crisis. Incompetent political leadership is the primary reason for a largely ineffective water infrastructure on the continent, the African continent. In most countries in the world, many of us have the chance to elect political leaders. When we sit back and do absolutely nothing, when that leadership fails, we also fail ourselves. Our silence may leave us thirsty, and sometimes we may drop dead. We have to, by the way, we have to, we have no other option but to demand that there be just and equal access for those that have been structurally excluded, mainly the poor people. Leaders are elected to bridge the gaps of injustice, not enhance it for personal gain. Here's what we can do. Here's what we must do. Acknowledge that no system will serve the people that, that it is created for unless if we speak about the structural injustice. And that is how we get put, and that's how we get water into people's hands. Our final speaker, Georgie Badil, believes that the global water shortage is a humanitarian crisis, demanding philanthropy. Georgie, an international model and former Miss Africa, is from Burkina Faso and is the founder and chairwoman of the Georgie Badil Foundation. There is no water crisis. There is a money crisis. And that is, as uh, someone from a country with gold on our ground beneath our feet. But that money never goes to the people. The gold is mine, the money is made, and we do not even get access to clean water. In 2003, I became Miss Burkina Faso, and the following year, I was crowned Miss Africa. I went on to become a model for international super brands like 
Louis Vuitton, Marc Jacobs, Diane von Furstenberg, Zeng Toy. But just like 663 million people around the world, I grew up without access to clean drinking water. As a child, I have to walk three hours with my grandmother to fetch water for our family. Water was, water is still. The woman is responsibility in my country and in the match of the developing world. Every day, women like me spend 266 million hours to work for water. And that is why I started the Georgie Badiel Foundation in 2015 to finance the building and repair of wells and create schools to empower women to do it for themselves. This is where the money comes in. We are teaching village women to build, repair, and maintain wells in their own village. They so desperately need for their daily water. We are empowering women by teaching them and pass it on generation to generation. So far, in four years, we have brought water to over 270,000 people in Burkina Faso and the sub-Saharan countries. We have been working with university partners and my government to develop a comprehensive plan to deliver water to 100% of our population within five years. There is no doubt in my mind that the world's wealthiest nation can handle water crises. Let's be real in here. These are the same nations that have been helping themselves with our resources for centuries. It is time. But will they finally stand up for humanity and say that no woman or girl should miss school in order to get water for a family? Right now, it is Fashion Week in New York. I could have stayed there and walk and make some money. But I choose to be here tonight to tell you that our generation want the world to change. We need the world to change. We can do it with money and with people like you right here in this room. It is time to trust us with the money. We will make the change. My approach is getting the money into the hands of the people on the ground, grassroots activists. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to all three of our speakers. A very passionate plea for what needs to be done to solve what some believe is a very real crisis, what others believe is just a facade for something much deeper. So is there a crisis of water scarcity or is that more of an issue of uh, structural injustice? Is it perhaps an issue of bad governance? Do we need more money to deal with this issue? Let me give you a quick recap of all three positions. Jana, who spoke first, believes that there is indeed a real crisis. She says we have to work together, that the key here is cooperation, even among traditional enemies, that the solution lies in the international system. The problem doesn't belong to one nation, she says, neither should the solution. The only way forward is through cooperation. Then we heard Obakeng, who sees the issue quite differently, say we do not have a crisis of water shortage at all. What there is, is a real deficit in justice, in access to water resources for the poorest in the world. He says we need to demand access for those who've been excluded, excluded structurally, that we need to make sure that we have the kinds of leaders who will be held accountable. And finally, Georgie also believes in many respects that there isn't really a water crisis as much as there is a crisis of humanity, a crisis of money and the need for more financial aid to make sure that this problem is addressed and addressed effectively. It's about empowering local grassroots organizations, the women and young girls 
in villages who are at the heart of this issue, who walk for hours every day, millions of, of hours, in fact, every day, just to get their hands on safe drinking water. It's about philanthropy and about generosity. So these, in a nutshell, are the three different positions. The question now is, where do you stand and which of these three uh, 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 positions do you most closely identify with? It's time to vote. We need your input to find common ground among the speakers. We want to know exactly how much value you attach to the arguments you've heard. You have a total of 100 points to divide. You can divide them over one, two, or all three statements. To do so, simply assign points to the statements on a sliding scale. All right, so onto your phones. Let's get your votes. And when, while we do, in fact, let me turn once more to our correspondent, Nell, to give us a sense of what people out there online have been feeling about this debate. Thank you, Rede. Yes, I mean, those are very powerful speeches and very powerful ways of, uh, of getting across the issue of solving the problem. That's what people online seem to be focusing on. There's a big divide between people uh, on Twitter here, at least, using that hashtag Dear World, asking what is the ratio between personal and public responsibility. Should it be 50-50? Is one person more responsible than a government? And then I just want to shout out to a couple of people here who have sent in photos of their viewing parties. That's a group of you who have come together to watch this crucial and important debate. We've got Matt Fanstock uh, in Pennsylvania, USA, with a class full of young people who are watching this debate go on. And another one, Khida, uh, in Doha, where we're used to being. More often than not, I think they miss us. Uh, they want us to come back, but the debate rages on on Twitter and we're getting some really interesting comments and questions. Great, Nalofar. Let me see now if we do have our results. I'll just wait to hear from our producer. I believe that we may have our results. Not just yet. Well, while we do wait for these results, uh, Nelufar, are you seeing any kind of trend emerge online? Absolutely. Um, a lot of the question seems to be about access, which all three of our speakers talk talked about, Rida. Access seems to be the main point. Is it a political issue? Uh, I've got a, a, a direct tweet here from Fatima who says, Dear world, water access should be an issue where all countries hand in hand help less developed countries. If we don't then, the world will live on and we wouldn't be able to survive past 2030. She says, I urge the youth to speak up. It's our world, we need to save it. Rida. Right. Thanks very much. And yes, I think we do indeed now have our results. Let's take a look and see which of these three positions have resonated the most with everyone who's participating in this discussion. I think there's a a clear position that is a little bit further ahead than the rest, and that is that water scarcity is just a facade. Let's address the real issues, the structural injustice issues. That was the position that was uh, expressed by Oba Kang. And then we've got uh, the issue of water scarcity being real, but the need to find pragmatic solutions and to cooperate. That was Jana's position. And finally, water scarcity is not the issue. Let's fund grassroots organizations. Uh, Georgie, your position at 28.3%. But let me just say that there is room, actually, for us to see these, uh, these results move forward. And you will get the chance to do this when I actually push the boundaries a little bit and delve a little bit deeper into each one of your perspective. And that's coming up next. Welcome to the Mejlis, a traditional Arab consensus building practice. The focus of the Mejlis is to welcome critical conversations and reach solutions. Kida will encourage our speakers to bridge differences and find common ground. So we talk about common ground and bridging differences, but can we get to a position of consensus? And in fact, I'd like to know what people in the audience, and of course those of you following us online, actually think of this, because I know there are lots of university students here in the audience in Cape Town with very strong views about this hot topic. So I would urge you to please think about the position and jump in at any point. We do not want to save this bit to last, but we want to delve right into our majlis, our discussion part, and I will begin the conversation with you, Georgie, because I was struck by some of what you said. As you mentioned, as a young child, as a young girl growing up in your village in Burkina Faso, you had to walk for hours, sometimes up to three and a half hours a day to fetch clean drinking water. And today, as a as a very successful career woman, you are doing your bit to help those other girls and children in your village. Uh, 
be able to spend less hours fetching water and to be able to focus on education and other things that are worthy of their time. But let's face it though, when you talk about the need for more money, more financial aid, is that really the solution? Isn't it just a band-aid that, as Oberkang suggested, just looks at the symptom but never really addresses the root causes of this issue, the structural injustice behind this whole issue? What do you say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I speak through my experience, and I love that Obenga uh, mentioned uh, injustice. You know, because uh, this is how I felt for years. You know, um, when I started the Georgie Badil Foundation, I have a lot of challenge, in the sense that as a young African woman, I. If today, let's say, um, I have the funds that I need to bring clean drinking water to the whole population of Burkina Faso, which is about 18 million, it will happen like this. Yeah, but yet yeah. this is why I think that money is very important. And as I said on my speech, uh, in just four years, we have brought water to over 270,000 people with very little funds. So what we raise goes to what doing the work. And what I see on the ground is the grassroots, small grassroots organization founded by young people like me, Generation Y and Z. We are getting the work done. This is why I believe in the grassroots organization. And I believe that if the funds are put in on the right ends, the work will be done. Because my generation, we do not want to wait anymore. We are tired of the struggle. Well, let's we ask, want the problem let's, to be let's solved. Let's ask the new generation. Obakeng, do you agree with what Georgie has just, has just said? I think you're 22 years old, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. There are lots of young yeah. people in the audience too. Georgie herself alluded to the pitfalls of calling on wealthy nations to come in and help. You talked about the exploitation of Africa's resources that you say has gone on for far too long, for centuries, in fact. By asking for more foreign aid, which Obakeng, you say you do not want to see more of, aren't you, in fact, opening yourself up to more of this form of neo-colonial economics under the guise, quite often, of aid? I mean, firstly, um, let us just address the fact that I think there's a part in targeting young girls and teaching them that like perpetuates the like gender expectation that it's a woman's responsibility to fetch water. On, on like one hand, you are seemingly delivering water because walls are there, but there's a part where, why don't you teach boys the same thing? Why, why, why did it become like women are going to be like our primary focus? Because I do understand that in like Sub-Saharan Africa, about 78% of like girls start, um, start school, but less than 8% of them finish secondary school. That I'm like, when we place these like expectations on like women to really, really perpetuate this like patriarchal expectation that they are, they're just there to be domesticated and to be quite frank. I will answer to that and say that um, the reason why my focus is on women and young girls is because they get the work done. With the work that, yes, they do. They do. Women will get the work done. With the work that have been doing in Burkina Faso, there is a lot of people that know, especially men, they know how to restore wells. But when uh, a well is broken in a village, the, uh, the people do not have money to repair the well. They will go to the men, they will be like, you pay me otherwise, you just go fetch the water. So women, me, uh, uh, by teaching women how to do it, they would pass the knowledge from generation to generation. But you know what? There's a world where a woman should, she should have options, right? That, that, that I'm like, you can't just reduce it to the fact that women, for sure, do not get stuff done. But like, I also know women that would love to have options of not, not having to dig a well. Just sit back and then have a man do it. That I may want to dig a wall. Yes. So, so, so like, let me just bring you well, back to the question we, that I was trying to ask. So we don't open this into yet another debate, a much bigger debate perhaps on, on the gender divide. Let me just bring you back to this point that Georgie clearly made and that you seem to disagree with. She says we need more aid, more finance to deal with the situation. You say no need for more aid. 
What do you say to those who believe that Africa, in fact, cannot stand on its own feet, and not just Africa, but many other governments around the world that are plagued by corruption and have limited financial resources? What do you say to those who believe you do need more finances? I think, I think there's a world where, okay, granted, you're given the money. And management of it, I mean, I don't know how many like, corruption scandals we, we like, deal with, particularly on the African continent, that throwing, throwing money at, at, a, at a problem for me has just never been an option because fundamentally what like, some of these like, international NGOs do is that the money comes with certain terms and conditions that are not disclosed. And then 20 years later, yes, you did have a wall, whatever, and you, you, you now find yourself in another problem of trying to regain your like, sovereignty because that money did have terms and conditions that I'm like, if that aid comes with terms and conditions that will fundamentally not do more good to the people that it's claiming to do good for, then we don't want it. So, Yana, how do you uh, look at this uh, conversation here uh, in that you clearly are the one, the only one on stage who believes that this isn't a myth and this isn't a facade, this is a real issue, especially for countries within the Middle East, which are among the most water stressed. Your own country, I know Jordan, is among the poorest water resourced countries. Do you still believe that cooperation is the way forward or that grassroots organizations and national governments should be the ones dealing with the problem? I'll always say and believe that cooperation is the only way forward. I mean, I definitely agree with both Georgie and Opagang that those are parts of the equation. Money is needed. Justice is needed. But we all need to be working together, all different levels. What we do um, as an organization is we work on the policy level. We bring uh, uh, decision makers to understand what needs to happen. We equip them and we empower them with the research needed, the studies, to bring the figures and the data that will show them that projects related to water issues should happen. But we also work with the grassroots levels. We empower them with the information to understand their water realities. Because they're the most affected and at the same time, they're the only ones that will make any project sustainable for the future. And in, in between and in the middle, we also bring in um, donor money because for Jordan and Palestine, donor money is needed. The countries can't afford to implement projects uh, uh, related to water and uh, sanitation. Um, or sure. are, it but would it, have been it, different. It all sounds wonderful on a theoretical level. Cooperation, as you say, for the mutual benefit of everyone, a win-win situation, you argue. But is it really the case when, take the Middle East, there are very blatant uh, asymmetries in the power structures that goes on, that, that, that exist in the region? If you just take the case of the Palestinians and Israelis and the, the Jordan River, which feeds so many of them, including Jordanians as well and, and others, Syrians, with some of the water. We know, we know the data has shown that Israelis get three to five times more access to clean, safe drinking water than Palestinians do. Can you really say there is cooperation and mutual benefit that, that actually delivers for everyone on an equal footing? What we want to create is that equitable sharing between people the projects that we're, uh, we're working on that are solution-oriented is not looking at the big picture alone. What we're doing, instead of the, uh, uh, the politics that want to be looking at all, solving all the final status issues together, we're taking water as a way forward. And what we're doing is slicing it into small pieces. That's important. If you talk to the Palestinian authorities, they're saying, why are you talking to us about the Jordan River when we don't have rights to the no, Jordan River? Is the question of but justice also important on a broader level? It's very important. nations among peoples. It's very important to bring that water justice. And what we're calling for is uh, we can't have except a uh, 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 justful peace between our people. But let's, again, focus on a basic human need, which is water, and start with that. 
This is how we build um, trust between the people living in the three countries. But what's more important is that we can't solve all the major problems of water rights all at once, but what we can do is start with small projects on ground for the Palestinians, let's say, because you mentioned Palestine, that would enable those people to stay and stick to their communities and then work for the bigger uh, uh, rights issues. For the bigger rights issue, are we also, by talking about these broad issues of justice and so on, are we missing some of the point, which is, as you well know, Oba Kang, and you've mentioned it, to do with bad governance? The African Development Bank said so much in the case of Africa that it's an issue of mismanagement of resources. Do you agree? Do you agree, Georgie? What should be done on that level, on that sort of policy level? Again, I'm going to come on my uh, standby is, to me, what I've seen from my experience is um, the government, the African government have shown uh, what they can do for the people, which isn't much. This is why we are still struggling. And from my experience, what can be solved? Who can solve the problem of philanthropy? Activists, grassroots. These are the people that are strongly, because I am on the ground every day. And the reason for me, uh, the reason why I focus on women is because water is a woman issue. Water is a woman problem in my country. You know, when I have to wake up at 6 a.m. to go fetch water with my grandmother, my cousin boys, my brothers were sleeping. Because they were just saying that, no, that's not the boy is problem. So for me to come in and solve that, it will take too long. So I have amazing women on the ground that I think is very important to empower them so that they can do it. And of course, everybody volunteer. So you want say, to learn how to build a well, you're welcome. And as you say, it will take too long to change all of these policies and put the light, right leadership in position, Obakeng. Would you agree? No. Isn't it better to have a philanthropist able to no. do the job right there and no, then? No, 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 no. For me, it's, the problem becomes that you can only solve for like such a small group of people. You can never do it at a national level. That I'm like, you, we can't afford to be apolitical about basic human rights. That the government is really mandated to like provide. That even this, the like province that we are in right now, you find that in Cape Town, townships use less than 5% of the city's water. And the other 95% of it goes to the suburbs, right? That I'm like, there's a deep conversation to be had here about how is it that townships have more people but get the least amount of water? Yet, yet you say there is no water scarcity issue. Can you seriously say that to the people of Cape Town? It's not a scarcity Town? issue. We're on the it's brink an of day zero. It's an access, but isn't it also an issue of scarcity? Jana, could you address this point before I actually turn to the audience and take a question from someone who is willing to ask a question on, in the front row? But let me just ask you as well, Jana, what do you say? What do we say to the people of Chennai, the city in India, which has almost ran out completely of water? Satellite images have shown that water levels in the main reservoir has actually shrunk to 1% of what it was last year. So there's definitely it's a, a reality. Yeah, it, it, there's definitely a water scarcity issue, and it's all uh, it's becoming even worse with the climate change that uh, um, we're all feeling it um, everywhere around the world. Um, but what I would like to ask both Obikang and uh, Georgie is that: Do you really believe that those are solutions on their own are practical moving forward? So it's only the government's responsibility alone or the civil society as the grassroots alone? Do you think that is sustainable to move us forward? So, De George, we work with the, uh, with, with the government to find the real solution of, on how we're going to bring clean drinking water to 100% of the population. To be honest with you, as grassroots, we cannot now work with the government. It's impossible, not in Burkina Faso. But now, uh, when it comes to funds, I strongly believe that the funds should land on grassroots organizations 
that will get the walk down. But what about the rules and regulations then? Who will protect access, equal access to people? How will we ensure that if we don't work with the government? Oh, we work with the government. Yeah. We work. We work together. That's what I'm saying. Okay. And, and yeah. you're saying... So targeted investments yeah. is what you're saying. Gobakeng, do you have a quick thought on this before I go to the audience? I definitely think cooperation is important. Um, but often in like corporations, um, people have very, very different invested interests in it. That I'm like, I would find it quite hard that someone with a very, very low economic muscle in like corporations of trying to spread out resources is going to be prioritized. That I'm like, imagine a world where government for me is the only force that can ensure that regardless of your socioeconomic class, that you can have access. That I'm not entirely sure that corporations that exist in some corners that we quite frankly don't know of can ensure that for every single citizen. So again, the social divides and the suspicions that it often breeds when it comes to big corporate interests. A quick, a quick question there from the audience. Okay, uh, so, so introduce yourself briefly and just make your, your question as, as, as quick and concise as you can. Yes. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Mlingi Sitemba Kumalo. I'm a Stellenbosch University student. And I'm currently standing at one question for uh, Georgie. The question is, okay, we understand that there's a fundamental problem here on the ground, which is water crisis, as said. But then I agree with Obakeng. This is not just a crisis. This has other elements on it, which is justice, inequality, and corruption, and power. So if you're going to talk about gender roles in addressing water, we're not really solving any problem. The problem is for every single human being who consumes water. So how do we tackle that at, at the cost of not looking people as individuals, but at looking at the problem collectively? So how can you, as a philanthropist, address that problem as a holistic thing above just gender roles? Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, you know, in Burkina Faso, when I say we have different realities, huh? on every country, we have different realities. In my country, Burkina Faso, water is a woman issue. And of course, on many other countries, it is. Um, a lot of men in villages have knowledge on how to restore, for example, a well. I've been to villages where they have wells, and there is men out there that have the knowledge to do it, but they won't do it until the village actually brings the funds to do it. All the, uh, the, the mayor comes in and do it. They will not do it. That is the reality that I have observed, and I live on the ground. That said, for me, it's very important to empower my sisters, my mothers, to do the work for themselves. Because tomorrow, uh, uh, if they don't bring the water home, if the man comes home at night and there isn't water, the woman will be in trouble. All right, so, so that's a way of me of solving ourselves. our problems. Georgie, let's, let's go to another question so we can make the most of the, the minutes left to us. This is Felicia Maluleke from UWC, University of Western Cape. So to you, Georgie, uh, you mentioned something that you're the founder of the Georgie Badiel Foundation, which requires funding, right? Mm -hmm. So on that issue of funding, how do you go on deciding who you're going to get money from and are there like, organizations that are an exception that you won't get getting money from? Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, you know, this, the struggle has been real, you know, uh, for uh, my organization, you know, to raise funds. But most of the time we go through, uh, we have a few corporations that are supporting us. We have um, a few organizations that are supporting us and mostly individuals and schools. So um, I'm hoping 
uh, to have uh, more you know, organizations that will come in and support what we do because we get the work done. We bring the water to the people. We empower the, wa we empower the people to sustain what they have. So let's see, are there any more questions for the other two speakers on stage? Good evening, my name is Monique. I'm 18 years old. As me being 18 and Obukeng, you 22, what do we as young people exactly do to make a change? How do we um, demand social justice? Mm. That's a really, really good question, and thank you for it. Let's just make an example. In this city that we're in, about a week and a half ago, a young, a young, a young UCT girl was murdered and raped. Right? And the government only responded because people mobilized and then demanded that there be a response. People are still trying to keep the same energy. What can we learn from that? If we sit back and do absolutely nothing for government, business continues as usual. But if you get to the point where you're saying we have a big enough group of people and you give them no other option but to listen. Power in numbers yeah. and power in mobilization. Another question from the audience. Thank you. Uh, firstly, bonsoir and uh, good evening. Um, my name is Rodrigue Kabuya. I'm from the University of Cape Town. I'm also with uh, an organization called One Africa Project. And my question is directed to Yana. Uh, I think you, you touched on the issue of the uh, Palestine and Israeli uh, issue. And I would just like to know, so one of the Doha debate's key uh, principles is working across differences. So how do we convince Israelis and uh, Palestinians, for example, to even agree or listen to meet uh, with one another? So what are the pragmatic ways that we can get this done? Thank you. Wonderful and a broad question to answer. But um, the first thing is uh, the aim for us is to really build trust. So we're very focused on highlighting the issues of the shared water resources. Um, uh, working with the grassroots, first of all, we prepare people on the national levels to understand their water reality their water reality, and what's happening, the challenges that are occurring around that shared water resource. For them to understand that it's shared and without cooperation, we will not be able to move forward. We also highlight what win-win situation this cooperation will bring uh, to enable us to move forward. On the policy level, like I said, we create research, research that is done by international teams, by teams from the three countries that support uh, uh, and provide decision makers with the data, with the numbers, to show that we, we will be creating win-win situations for all if we are to cooperate uh, um, to achieve better water management for our shared resources. So, so as we touch on uh, this issue of conflict resolution, perhaps a good place to bring in our connector, uh, Govinda Clayton. We've stirred things up a little bit here on stage. Do you see much need for mediation among our three speakers? Well, there's always need for mediation. But um, I mean, I, I think it's been really interesting hearing all the speakers touch on a range of different topics and there's been different positions put out there. But underlying this seems to be a lot of commonalities between everybody. Um, so first of all, I think this kind of focus on whether or not there's a scarcity crisis, whether it's a crisis, whether it's scarcity, is perhaps not important because there seems to be a broad understanding between everybody that there's clearly a problem and there's a range of different solutions that all need to be adopted in order to address this problem. And so I think Jana set this out quite nicely, but I think we also saw compliments from the other speakers as well. That Clearly there's an ecosystem of different responses that each need to be undertaken at different levels, whether that be at the grassroots level, the national level or the international level. Thanks very much, Govinda, for these thoughts. We're going to be checking on the pulse of this room one more time with a second vote in just a few minutes. We, in fact, have three minutes for two more questions from the audience. So let's get the first one. Um, hello, my name is Chantal from Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Um, my, it's not really a question, but it's to stir up the conversation. Um, with all these 
topics happening, where does innovation come in? Because we are a generation that's moving into innovation and that's like the, the solution to most of our problems. So where does it fall in here? Thank you, very important question. Innovation and innovative technologies, how much room is there for that? We've got people around the world as we speak looking at all sorts of ways to bring innovation into this equation. Georgie, to you. Yeah, I wanted to add that um, one thing that we also do is uh, we partner with universities so that they can help us bring the right solution, innovative, uh, uh, so that the whole country, I would say, Burkina Faso is, a, is the first country that I'm focusing on, but that solution that we will find, hopefully that will help uh, the other countries, Mali, Niger, and, you know, uh, hopefully the whole world. But yes, we are partnering with uh, universities to come with something great, innovative, uh, to bring clean water to the world. Should we also be looking at uh, old-fashioned ways of looking at this, recycling, using wastewater, as Namibians have been doing for the past five decades? Oberking, very quickly. Yeah, so in terms of innovation, I'll give you a very, very personal example. So last year, I moved down to Cape Town, and I was obviously looking for, like, a house, and, and then I ended up getting, like, a house share with, like, a bunch of friends. And we did something very, 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 very basic. When you shower, you know that water sometimes, like a lot of water spills on the ground. We use some of that water to now also flush toilets. That is us saying, you know what, life may depend on water, but conservation of it largely depends on us. That I'm like, it's not necessarily innovation in terms of technology, it can also be innovation in terms of changing your behavior. Should we be changing our behavior in the Middle East context as well, where there's a lot of money spent on desalination, about 70% of the investments, with, as we know, the side effects when it comes to the environment and health. Should we be looking more at new technologies, uh, water harvesters? And definitely. I mean, there is no one proper solution for all, but definitely a part of what we should be doing um, is looking at the small initiatives. Um, even in the rural communities of, uh, and this is something we promote all the time, rainwater harvesting, uh, decentralized solutions for treatment plants, uh, green filters, those are very important to happen. And then we look at big projects like the desalination projects. Do we have a final quick comment before we take the vote? Yeah, um, water, it's 2009, water is a life source. Um, and yet I feel as if we're sitting in a Mad Max film watching it. So my question is, what about education? You spoke about money. Money leads to corruption. You spoke about social injustice leads to education. You spoke about partnerships. If we're honest with each other, are we really in partnerships? Are we doing our best for social justice by educating our youth? Where is our youth? And then All you right. talk about yeah. so, so we got money. to the point and we have to leave it there, unfortunately, because I think I will ask each of our speakers to address these points, raising awareness and education in their final comments and the issue of money as well. I do have to go to a very quick vote, so I'd ask everyone to get onto their phones one more time and to see whether they've been swayed in any direction by the arguments that were just made. And in the meantime, Nell, to you once again, to give us a sense of what's going on online. I'm trying to keep a hold of what's going on online. There's chatter all around me. You guys have really gotten into the meat and bones of this issue. But I've got so much debate and discussion being had online. First and foremost, um, hello to Palestine or Palestinians watching us on Twitter at Doha Debate using that hashtag Dear World. I've come across someone with the handle at Sad Palestinian. And uh, she says, I think a really important issue that should be addressed is the debate in their privatization of water, a basic human need by corporations and how capitalism is one of the main causes of this issue. And then, Rida, we've got a general consensus again about the need to have a multifaceted approach to this. But there seems to be a lot of comments here about asking, how do we run out of water in the first place if we've got a certain amount of water? I mean, it, it's definitely not a stupid question. It's definitely an intelligent one. But how do we run out of it in the first place? Now, for those of so you who are watching... Have our results in. 
quick, quick final remark? Yes. For those of you who are watching online, make sure you stay tuned for the post show because that is when we will get to the rest of the questions here and to you online. Bitte. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Nelufar. Let's put up these results. And I suppose let's have the first round up initially so we can compare both. So our first results are there on screen as you can see them. 30%, 41% and 28% has the needle moved very far. I don't think it has, even though, again, clearly the second position that was articulated by Yu Obakeng is the one that seems to have garnered the most vote. So in your closing remarks, please address that final question that was asked, the need to educate not just girls, boys as well, the young, new generation, to, to take care of this vital resource, which is obviously not finite, to Yu Obakeng. To be quite honest, I think there's a conversation to be had about knowing what to do and you actually doing it. That I don't think people don't know how to take care of, of like water or like to be thoughtful about it. The question is, are they willing to? If they're not willing to, then how do you, how do you enforce that water be taken care of? Because it goes to the question of how do we even run out of water in the first place? And I would argue it's purely because of poor management of it. Management of thinking, ah, oh, this thing is just going to be here forever. Okay, so just in a word or two, the solution for you? Solution in terms of? The solution for this problem moving forward, if you were just to say it in a word or two, what would it be? I just think that systems have to be created with a just philosophy. A just philosophy for you, Georgie. Someone asked about the issue of money. Is it still all about money for you, or is there much more to it? And you heard different perspectives here today. To me personally, is when we have the money, we get the work done. So we need the money to get the work done on the ground. That's the reality. That's what we are living. Uh, now, only in Burkina Faso, there is over 5,000 broken wells. And those wells, building a well is engineering. And to me, it's kind of like giving a car to someone that does not know how to drive. This is when education comes in. This is when education, educating women is very important to me so they can pass it on from generation to generation. And investing in grassroots organization in partnership with the government can get the work done. Right. Thank you. Getting the work done through education, through investment, through money in the right hands. For you, Yana, what is the solution? You yourself alluded to the point that cooperation has its limit. We saw with climate change, didn't get us very far. Yes, but we still need to cooperate. That's the only way forward. Um, on the national levels, all different stakeholders, including people, ourselves, we need to know what is our role that we should play. Um, um, scientists, uh, uh, funds, um, governments, we should all be strategizing on a justful pay, uh, uh, base together uh, to ensure that water is in the hands of everyone. Education is a very important role. Um, 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 so, so, so on this note, for you, it's about education. It's about the small actions that we can all take on an individual level, but beyond that, about policies that are put together at the national, sub-regional, international levels as well. As I thank you all very much indeed for, and I know we would want to continue the conversation, but unfortunately we must end it here. We will continue this conversation with our audience and obviously online as well. I am reminded though by the great South Africa Nelson Mandela as we end that anything that seems impossible is until it's done. And as we end our discussion, I'm also reminded by another great South African, the African human rights activist, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, the Archbishop, Desmond Tutu, who also said something quite interesting. He once said, do your little bit of good where you are. It is those little bits of good put together that can actually overwhelm the world. So something for each one of us to think about, as I thank you all for being part of this important discussion. Thank you to all of the students from Cape Town who joined us. Thank you to our three wonderful speakers who have so much more to say. Our next debate on capitalism will be in Doha on the 23rd of October. We hope that you'll be able to join us then. Till then, from me, Rida Fakhri, and the entire Doha Debates team, though, thanks very much indeed for being with us. See you soon.